person who uh, would do the right answer. Do you live in the district? I, I just moved down from Boston. There you go. Okay. So here's what it means. The District of Columbia is a peculiar jurisdiction. We have over uh, close to 700,000 people in the District of Columbia. Um, there really are kind of two DCs. There's a, a DC that's doing quite well uh, economically with the <coughs> highest level of education in the country. And there's another DC um, that is uh, a couple of pockets in DC where, you know, to be honest with you, the education system, high crime, high poverty, you know, um, it creates just a significant disparity. Um, but the entirety of D.C. is an extraordinary jurisdiction. D.C. residents pay, for example, more taxes to the federal government than 22 other states. Uh, yet, D.C. residents uh, do not have a voting member in Congress. Ergo, that's what that tag is all about. Uh, the way that impacts D.C., of course, is that D.C. residents are not able to you know, really, really push forward their view uh, before the Senate or the House. Another way in which this impacts the District of Columbia is that the District of Columbia has a city council and a mayor. Again, not a state, but if it were a state, that city council would be a state legislature and the mayor would be uh, a governor. So the city council, speaking for its residents, passes law and the mayor signs legislation uh, into law. Only in D.C. is it true that the federal government, in this case Congress, can decide to invalidate laws passed by the D.C. City Council or not. And so part of the process of our passing laws having signed in is that we send those laws over to Congress and they literally sit for 45 days, after which point, if Congress doesn't intercede, then the passed law from the D.C. elected local uh, folks becomes law. What that means is that on the overwhelming majority of issues, D.C. values as represented by the voters do actually find their way into the law. But some other issues on which you know, voters might disagree nationally oftentimes get invalidated or are subject to be invalidated by any uh, congressperson um, you know, in the country, whether they live, uh, whether they spend much time in D.C. or not. So, for example, reproductive rights, um, any legislation that D.C. passes is oftentimes fraught with peril as Congress might intercede and not allow for more, I'll just say, progressive uh, reproductive rights. The same is true with respect to um, common sense gun restrictions. D.C. residents uh, tend to be in favor of all kinds of background checks. Uh, Congress can come in at any time and invalidate a DC law uh, in that area. The same is true and uh, occurred, in fact, in regards to marijuana. I know many of your home states are debating whether to go, uh, most states have already had the conversation around medical. Many states are focused on whether to go recreational. A few years back, the D.C. voters, by a large percentage, about 73 percent, voted to go legal recreational. They previously voted to go legal medical. Legal recreational passed. Congress tried to mess that up, but they did not follow their own timeline, so their attempt to invalidate legal recreational marijuana uh, didn't pass muster, although they were able to prevent the District of Columbia lawmakers from actually regulating or taxing marijuana. So we've got this crazy regime now in the District of Columbia where individuals can choose to uh, you know, take marijuana and, and consume it in their private homes, but you cannot purchase it and we, the government, cannot tax it in any way, nor can the government impose regulations on things like edibles and other stuff. And so DC oftentimes finds itself in a curious zone. Okay, so I got my DC pitch out. It's really important, I think, again, as you go back home, to understand what DC means when it talks about being part of the, uh, of the country, being the nation's capital, and yet, 
paying a lot of taxes, but not having true representation. I'll leave you with this. D.C. is the only national capital of any country where the residents of that national capital, right here the District of Columbia, do not have voting representation before the federal body. It's uh, truly uh, something that needs to, to change, and I've done my part in educating you to go ahead and advocate for that change when you get back home. Thank you. That's an exchange for no subpoena. Okay. All right, now to the AG world. Um, the AGs, I think, have become ascendant in the United States. Uh, they become ascendant, um, I think it started really about, call it, 10 years ago, uh, when uh, President Obama started making moves towards drafting legislation and passing the Affordable Care Act. It's really at that time that most of the uh, Republican attorney generals started suing the federal government, um, you know, like almost every day. And so they sued initially to prevent the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and then eventually that matter would go to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court essentially um, approved or found that the law uh, was not uh, unconstitutional. Um, of course, Republican AGs also sued the administration in regards to immigration laws. Uh, DACA, there was a, a DAPA that applied to the parents of dreamers, and so a lot of those lawsuits uh, really occupied the attention of the federal courts. Well now, of course, uh, President Trump is in office, uh, President Obama is no longer in office, and certainly the Democratic attorney generals have kind of taken a sheet of the playbook uh, from the Republicans and have really focused on what Democratic AGs view as excessive uh, federal um, regulation or federal encroachment in constitutional areas. That's why the Democratic Attorney Generals uh, sued on things like the, the travel ban and are certainly in lawsuits trying to preserve the remnants of the Affordable Care Act, are standing up for the Dreamers and DACA, uh, and I myself am suing the President along with the AG, Brian Frosch, from the state of Maryland under a constitutional clause called the Emoluments Clause. And so you've got a lot of AG action on these national issues. That's why I said earlier that AGs are truly ascendant. Let me give you a little bit of political backdrop in that regard. This year, um, there are not only midterm elections, which are obviously incredibly important to both parties, but there are also a lot of AG elections. So this year, uh, in November, 35 attorney general offices uh, will be decided by the elections. 32 races and three other races where either the governor or the state legislature will determine who the attorney general is. So there's a lot of politics also around the AG space. Now why do I mention all this? I mention all this because what I want you to know is that notwithstanding the ascendancy or kind of nationalization of uh, AG work, AGs as elected officials know that their bread and butter is where politics has always been, local. And so AGs, Republican or Democrat, whether they're getting involved in fancy suits like the Emoluments Clause litigation or other important work, they're nonetheless always focused on consumer protection. And consumer protection, of course, is something that I'm sure, and I know, that you're very, very, very concerned with. And I can tell you that whether it's a Republican AG or a Democratic AG, AGs are willing to cross the lines uh, to collaborate on AG investigations, whether it's a D who's commenced it, or an R, so long as the AG believes that consumer well-being is at stake and there's an opportunity to stand up for the consumers uh, in their states. Now look, what's really important, given all the incredible technology and the different channels that you have to interact uh, with consumers, 
It's important, it's incredibly important for you to understand, I know you do, that the basic laws never change. And so what are those laws? Number one, they've got to be honest, right, uh, when you're dealing with consumers. Misrepresentations, whether by email, uh, telephone, or any other medium, are the fodder of things that state AGs will absolutely react to and seek to enforce. Back when I was at a private law firm, uh, Carl mentioned I worked at a firm here called Venable LLP, a national firm. Um, I can tell you that I oftentimes represented clients against state attorney general and against sometimes federal uh, investigators. I became aware that, my goodness, state AGs as well as federal um, agencies oftentimes did not fully understand the nature of my client's business, and that oftentimes they were too often, uh, too, too often too ready to jump to a conclusion of wrongdoing or potential wrongdoing before they actually sat out and tried to understand exactly what we're doing and what we're not. And so at the Venable Law Firm, uh, part of our business really was really focused on representing great companies and clients and industries, and we would always seek to group them into associations where they would begin robust self-regulating um, procedures. And so SROs are something that many AG and I'm certainly familiar with. I can tell you this is how AGs think about SROs. They're pro-SROs, um, so long as the SROs are transparent uh, with the kind of principles uh, that they organize around, that they truly enforce um, important principles in the SRO. A common question that an AG will ask when an, uh, a group is represented by an SRO is give me an example of a business that you would not admit to your SRO. Now, I've seen companies uh, and SROs answer that question really well. I'll give you a couple of examples. And then I've seen them not answer it well. But well, we've admitted everybody who's paid to do. Okay? The next AG question is a tough question. Can you give me an example of a member that you actually had to either discipline or ask to leave? Generally speaking, the best answers are I can give you examples of members, um, maybe I'm not going to name them, but I can give you examples where we've imposed discipline, put them on probation, or even better from the perspective of an AG, where we've asked a member to leave. It's really the, the teeth, both in terms of entry into the SRO, as well as the teeth in terms of discipline and removal from an SRO that in AG's minds, right, makes the distinction of an SRO that is truly about its principles and values or an SRO in name only. One of the worst things that can happen is to have an SRO in name only. Because what that means is the AGs will start getting uh, excited and start buzzing around to really see exactly what's going on within the industry itself. A few other issues I want to talk about. Um, privacy. I mentioned privacy earlier. Um, I think it's the case that the federal government has not passed a comprehensive privacy law since about the mid-1970s. Because of the, the absence of, of the uh, federal legislatures, you're starting to see more and more uh, states getting into that space. And of course, most recently, California uh, passed a, a pretty aggressive uh, privacy law. Uh, the California AG, Javier Becerra, is a dear friend, and I know that he himself is concerned about aspects of that California law uh, in that its reach is so broad, and it also requires his office to do a lot of enforcing, uh, candidly, without giving him the resources. 
In the privacy globe, and I've said globe intentionally, the privacy world, um, you know, privacy regulation has been led by Europe. And Europe, of course, has got the GPDR. And I must tell you that many states, as they're looking at revamping their own privacy regimes, are, in fact, looking to the GPDR uh, for guidance. It's not as if the states are ready to adapt a holistic, you know, kind of European um, perspective on privacy uh, into their jurisdictions, but because of the absence of privacy legislation in the Fed world uh, and a more robust uh, regime in Europe, it's quite natural that they would look over to Europe to see what's working uh, and what is not. I make this point to you because state AGs are often <coughs> misunderstood. Oftentimes people view an AG interaction as an interaction that only occurs, God forbid, when there actually is a subpoena underneath your, you know, your chair. It's cr incredibly important, I think, uh, for businesses uh, as well as industries or trade associations like PACE to really have on your agenda active advocacy before state attorney general. So when I speak to groups like yours, I oftentimes ask, hey, how many people here have ever had an interaction with their hometown state AG? Put your hand up if that's right. That's great. Okay, so I usually get about that. So that's roughly about, I'd say maybe 10 to 15% of the room, or even less. Of the folks who raised their hand, how many of those interactions occurred as a result of an AG you know, request, maybe subpoena, or just request to come that you visit? Okay, those are not the meetings that you want to have. <laughs> right? Is that fair? Um, and so what's the way for you to, you know, get out of having those kinds of meetings and have other meetings? Well, the way to do that, uh, candidly, is for you all to not view the AG as this kind of lurking ghost that you don't ever want to see, but instead as a responsible uh, officer in the state that has, as part of his or her jurisdiction, a fairly important area of your business. And so it's incredibly important, and I really urge you to do this, to go about establishing relationships with those attorney generals. What you'll find if you seek a meeting with a consumer protection officer, or indeed AG, him or herself, is that they'll appreciate having the opportunity to learn about your interaction with your customers and your businesses before they have anything to do with investigating any of those businesses. You will also have an opportunity, which I find to be an incredibly important opportunity, to become a thought leader on areas where AGs really have a lot of questions. Uh, and so, if you're gonna take one thing away from our interaction today, don't look at AGs as these spooky ghost figures. Look at them instead as responsible folks who are trying to get it right for their consumers who don't exactly know how business interacts with all their consumers, who probably don't have a sense of the areas in which you all share in common with AGs. For example, robocalls. Now, most AGs may not know that there are appropriate robocalls, right, unless they're making them, <laughs> um, or inappropriate robocalls, right? My guess is that this room, generally speaking, um, is not in favor of the illegal, harassing robocalls. Is that fair? Yep. <laughs> There's a man in a red, nice red sweater who will be leaving with a subpoena. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, all good, all good. <laughs> but those are, but seriously, that's an example of a conversation that's well worth your while having with a governmental authority that could, you know, actually, you know, cause not only you to spend time, but also money, uh, you know, in regards to an investigation that need not have been launched, right? Okay. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to 
I have prepared remarks and I've not even looked at them. Um, and I'm sure there's some relevant stuff here that was missed. Uh, but instead of going through that check uh, list, I'm going to instead uh, say thank you very much uh, for inviting the AG of the District of Columbia to come and speak to you. Um, welcome to the District of Columbia. Think about you know the peculiar status that the District of Columbia has and how it's kind of just not American uh, that, uh, that DC residents don't have a voting say uh, in Congress. <coughs> Then focus on your business, right? SROs work so long as they're actually real teeth, hard to get in, not so hard to get out, right? And then think about what I said about the number of issues you have related to interaction with the, uh, the, the pulse of your business, that's the customer. And think about ways in which you might make outreach to AGs to educate them as to who you are and what you're doing. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, if not, uh, it looks like it's lunchtime, and uh, perhaps you guys will go to lunch. So thank you very much. We do have time for about one question. So does anybody have a question? All right, then. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, y'all.